far into the formal remarks, so we'll uh, we'll start again. Thank you for joining us uh, for this evening's installment of our Nepean Sailing Club Winter Speaker Series. As you likely know, tonight we've got uh, Van Shepherd, uh, who's going to be giving us a little bit of a talk and a presentation and some advice on sailing uh, in heavy weather and what to do if caught in a squall. Uh, that is going to be very interesting. Uh, you may also uh, be aware that this is the 16th year that uh, the Winter uh, Talks Speaker Series has been going on at Nepean Sailing Club. And uh, I have to say, I think it's probably been in the last two or three years of the pandemic uh, when we've been doing these events, such as we are tonight, at least. I guess we haven't been doing them hybrid until this year, but the virtual uh, speaker series was one of those things that was something that was a, one of those lifelines during the pandemic. And it kind of was a connection to our hobby in this place and all these people and our friends. So it's been neat to see some of these things during the pandemic continue and to, to, to be useful, such as this hybrid format. So onward we go. And uh, I have to say, I've really enjoyed these talks in the last few years. Uh, just so folks also are aware, these are obviously free of charge. Um, and so you may have noticed when you did register online uh, at the Eventbrite site that you could make a donation uh, that would go towards the Nepean Sailing Club Legacy Fund. So if you didn't catch it that this time, uh, maybe try to, to make a donation in future weeks. Uh, quickly, by the way, my name is Jeff Smith and I'm a member here at the club as well. Uh, how you doing everybody? Um, Rebecca Heller will be the, the guest, the speaker next week and she's gonna be talking about foiling high-speed racing and development and pathways to athlete development. So that one is going to be uh, next week with Rebecca Heller. Um, I'm going to introduce, let Van come up. Uh, I'll quickly just uh, speak a little bit about Van. He's been sailing for over 30 years, uh, racing competitively for 25. Uh, he's cruised in Atlantic Canada, raced in Ontario, Nova Scotia, Newfoundland, and throughout the United States. Uh, his cruising has been in heavy displacement boats. Racing background is in dinghies, sport boats, and light displacement keels. He's a mechanical engineer as well, so he'll bring a little bit of knowledge on the side uh, to, to what he's going to talk about tonight. Uh, but mostly, mostly some experience with big wind and waves and how to manage all that stuff when you're out on the water. I'll quickly also just add for the process of Van's talk, he has five... Um, different sections to the talk. At the end of each of the five sections, I think it's going to be obvious, Van, he suggests maybe do the questions on that topic at the end of each of those five sections. It's about a half dozen slides, uh, 10 or 15 minutes, I think. So hopefully that is clear. Uh, there'll be some questions on YouTube. Uh, it should be obvious or clear where to enter those questions, and we'll try to get on the mics with anything that comes online. Um, but beyond that, uh, I'm going to get my butt away from here and we're going to get Van up and hear about uh, what to do when caught in a squall in the wild weather and uh, and all that stuff. So Van Shepard, come on up. Thanks everybody and uh, more to come. All right. uh, I was asked by Dominic to do this. Uh, I don't normally talk about my sailing. Um, so... Uh, so hopefully people don't laugh too much at me when I, I tell you what I do when I'm in big wind. Um, but I, I usually do okay in big wind, so, so probably what I do works pretty well. Um, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start by telling you a little bit about myself. Um, so the, the, the stuff that I am, that, that was already uh, given to you by the MC. I didn't realize I was going to have an introduction. Um, I, I want to talk a little bit about the stuff that I'm not as well, uh, because sometimes questions can get pretty specific. And uh, I'm not a sail maker. Uh, I understand how I trim my sails, uh, but my knowledge is definitely not sail maker grade. Uh, I, I'm not a professional sailor. I don't get paid to sail ever, but that would be nice. Uh, I'm also not a rigger, although I do have my own boat, but I, again, I don't do that professionally. And uh, I, I'm not a teacher or a coach. You can ask my kids that. They'll tell you dad's not a coach. Uh, um, so those, those things all to say that uh, I'm happy to share my knowledge tonight, and that's what I'm here for. Uh, but I, I qualify it by saying I'm not any of those things. So you, you take what you can and, uh, and understand that, it, that it's not coming from a professional. Uh, all right, so these are pictures of, of me racing. Uh, no, actually, that's not true, of me sailing. Uh, two of them are racing. 
the uh, the big one is me uh, and my Viper with my crew uh, sailing upwind in Lake Champlain. Uh, the planing one downwind, which is a, a great shot of the Viper, is uh, me in Long Beach, again, sailing downwind. And the one in the bottom right-hand corner is me in an albacore uh, sailing upwind, and that's in Perry Sound. Uh, the one thing they all have in common is they're all in pretty good wind. And uh, and when you can when you're comfortable sailing in pretty good wind, you can have a lot of fun in a boat, especially if it's a, a light displacement boat, because uh, when they have big wind, they like to go fast. Um, we'll, we'll come to it in a later section, but uh, make note of the picture of, of how everybody's dressed in the in the, the picture where you can see us pretty well, uh, how you get how you're dressed for that kind of weather makes a big difference to whether it's an enjoyable experience or an unpleasant one. So I, I'm going to break the top the break the presentation down into five different topics tonight. We're going to talk about heavy air in general, and that's just what, what are the differences between heavy air and when you go out and sail on an eight or ten knot day. Right? Eight or ten knots in a sailboat is is perfect. Right? You have just enough power to go. You're not overpowered in any condition. Uh, waves aren't too big, life is pleasant, uh, and then you go up five knots and it starts to get less pleasant, and you go up five knots more and it's, it's way less pleasant, and it's just five knots. At five knots of wind speed, you don't really have that much to do, but there's a big difference between eight and 13 knots. Uh, then we're going to talk about our boat. Um, uh, not all boats are the same. Uh, even in the same class, not all boats are the same. If you go walk our docks and look at the the nicest, most well-kept shark, and you look at the most dilapidated shark, and I don't know what that one would look like, but I've seen a couple of dilapidated sharks out there. One of those boats is gonna be fun to sail and breeze, and one of them is not. But that's that's true whether there's breeze or not. The, the one that's dilapidated and is not maintained, that's not fun to sail in any conditions, but it's probably dangerous to take that boat out in big wind. Uh, also gonna talk about your crew, uh, and I won't talk about crew as dilapidated, that's, that's, that's not nice, but there's, <laughs> There's a, there's a certain level of physical and sailing ability you want to have to go out and, and enjoy yourself in big wind. And if you don't have it, the only way to get it is to go out and sail in big wind, but you don't want a, a full crew. Like if you have a five-person crew on your boat and all five of you have never gone out in big wind, that might not be the way to try it. You might want to maybe join a crew where three or, four, three or four or five of them, well, five, I guess three or four of them already know what they're doing and they can bring you along. Uh, then we're going to talk a little bit about boat handling. Honestly, boat handling is pretty simple. You're, you're going to do two things in big breeze. You're going to tack and you're going to jive, just like you do in medium bees or light breeze. And, and we're going to talk briefly about the things you want to watch for when you tack or jive in big wind. And then about sail trim. I didn't focus this talk on racing. I, I wanted to keep it general enough to apply to people who are going to go sail in big wind, regardless of whether you're on the race course or you're just heading up to pennies or, uh, or, or something like that. But if people want to talk about sailing, about racing and trimming sails, I'm happy to share what I know. Uh, and at the end of each of these sections, uh, that'll be the time when we, we can have some discussion or, or take questions if you have them. Okay, so heavy air in general. So that's a, that's a lovely picture. That's Lake Michigan. Uh, and I've seen Lake Michigan look like that. I've seen Lake Huron look worse than that, actually. Um, so heavy air in general, the difference between heavy air and I'll say medium air, comfortable air, is uh, is that wind velocity has a huge impact on the forces that your boat sees. Um, and the forces that your sails see means that the loads that you experience on all your sheets and control lines, uh, all your standing rigging, all your running rigging, they all go way up as well. And it also introduces waves. So you're sailing an eight to 10 knots of breeze out here on the lake. Even if the wind's coming from the northwest, which is our longest fetch, the waves are pretty gentle, right? You might be a little bump up, but there's no water coming over the boat and, and life is good. It's, it's not quite flat, but it's pretty close to flat. But when you get into a situation where you have a, a lot of wind, it always comes with a lot of waves and waves are a whole different dynamic all on their own. When you start sailing and, and enjoying big wind and you want to go racing in big wind, you, you learn first how to manage the wind and then how you deal with the waves. Uh, the waves are, are, are a, a huge factor and, and they're, they're not what people always think about when they think about heavy air. They think about wind and cold and how do I dress for it, but it, it's really how do you deal with the waves in your boat. Um, your boat is constantly overpowered. No matter what you do, uh, 
uh, your boat's going to be on or ear if you're going upwind, or it's going to be looking to put its bow into the wave in front of it if you're going with the waves. Um, and, and nothing you can do is going to fix that short of taking down all your sails. Uh, pitching and rolling constantly, that's back to the wave thing again. Right, so maneuvers that are comfortable when you're in eight to 10 knots of breeze become a, how am I supposed to pull on this line at the same time as I've got one hand to hold myself up and I don't fall over the side of the boat when we tack too fast and all of a sudden we're on a rear. So the pitching and rolling that you encounter, that, that keeps things interesting too. And it's noisy and it's wet. And quite often here, if it's a squall coming through, it can get a little bit cold too. So the environment is, is a challenging one. Uh, so let's talk a little, a little bit about high forces. So uh, forces on sails increase with the square of the speed of the wind. Don't know if everybody knows that or not, but if you're sailing in 10 knots of breeze and your boat is comfortably powered up and life is good, and then you go from 10 to 15 knots of breeze, it's more than twice as much power in your sail plan. So you could get the same speed in your boat if you had half the area of sail just going from 10 knots to 15 knots of breeze. And if you go from 10 knots to 20 knots of breeze, it's four times as much. So if you're sailing in a boat like, like, like I sail, and I sail a Viper, and in a Viper, myself and my two sons are fully hiked out when we've got eight to nine knots of breeze. So that's it. I don't need any more, any more wind to go upwind at, at hull speed uh, in a Viper. So at 15 knots, so eight, 64, 225. So go from eight to 15 knots is about four times as much wind as, as we need in terms of horsepower in our sail plan. So that's, that's something to keep in your mind. Going from 12 to 15 knots is not a small change. It's a big change in the power in your sail plan. Uh, so I, I, I've got the second boat there as lift increases, drag also increases. So a, a, a sail is a wing uh, when you're going upwind anyway. When you're going downwind, it depends. In our boat, a sail is still a wing. In a, in a boat that just sails dead downwind in displacement mode, your, your sails turn into big barn doors when you go down, when you basically pop them out and the wind pushes them and away you go. Uh, but if you're sailing in a, a boat where you're sailing angles across the wind, all your sails are like big wings. So air goes over the outside fast, goes over the inside slow, you get a pressure difference and that pressure difference is lift and it becomes a force that pushes your boat forward. Uh, when we talk about the force on the sails going up, going from 10 to 20 knots means you're, you're going from enough power to four times as much power as you need. Um, the other issue with lift, in, and it's an airplane problem too, but as your lift goes up, your drag goes up. And drag is an undesirable, drag is what prevents you from going uh, forward. It's also what drags you sideways through the water. Uh, it's, a, it's a bad force and it, it becomes a very dominant force as the winds go up. So, uh, so that's, that's what happens above the water. Below the water, you're not going four times as fast as you were. You're not going two times as fast as you were even. So your rudder is just as powerful as it was when you had 10 knots of breeze. Your keel is also just as effective as it was when you had 10 knots of breeze. So everything above the water, you take the duck analogy, right? The, the, the feet are going crazy below and things up top are calm. It's the other way around in, in big breeze, right? Everything below is calm. You're, everybody's going through the water, same speed as they were at 10 knots. They're happy, your rudder and your keel. Your sail plan is not so happy, right? It's, it's flogging, the, the, the wind is doing things to it that it shouldn't do. Uh, so you have a lot, more, uh, a lot more forces up in your sail plan and, a lot, and the same forces basically underneath the water dealing with that. So that makes it harder to manage, right? Because you've got the, the forces that, so when you're using your keel, your keel stops you from going sideways when your sail plan tries to push you that way and your rudder turns you to, to keep your feathering into the wind. So those things work as effectively in 10 knots as they do in 20, but all the things that are trying to mess you up, make you go sideways, like the, the drag force in your sails, or, or turn you up and down, which is the moving of the, the wind in the sails, those things are all a lot more powerful now, so it becomes a lot more challenging to steer your boat in those environments. Uh, so there, I don't know if that was helpful, but that's, that's a pretty good description of what happens as the wind goes up. So high loads. So again, as force on sails increase, the loads on the control lines go up as well. Uh, loads on standing rigging also increase, and that causes it to stretch. Don't know if people realize that. If you've ever sailed upwind, especially in a breeze, uh, and this is true on pretty much any boat I've ever been on, you look at the windward shroud, it's always very tight. You look at the leeward shroud in big breeze, they're often pretty loose. 
And that's because your windward shroud has stretched considerably. Um, and, and that's also true of your forestay. It will also stretch. And when your forestay stretches, it sags and sagging powers up your jib and you don't need your jib to be more powerful when the wind is blowing that hard. So it's a, it's, it's not a good combination of things. So the, the loads increase on the, the ropes you're using to control the sails and it also increases on your standing rigging. Uh, load from the windage on your hull and your rig also start to become a factor. And that's particularly true in light displacement boats. But that, that's again, it's drag. So you have drag in your sail plan. You also have drag from your hull. Like if you ever look at a, a racing, like a high performance racing boat versus a cruising boat, the racing boats have almost no, uh, no cabin top. Uh, and they don't want superstructure because superstructure is windage. So, so that's, uh, if you've ever wondered why, why racing boats look different than uh, cruising boats, it's because windage is a bad thing for a racing boat. Waves. So we talked about waves a little bit earlier, but uh, waves get bigger as wind increases. Uh, and the more fetch you have. So I don't know, is everybody here sailed out on our lake? Like, can I use examples from our lake and everybody's going to nod their head and understand what I'm talking about? So if, if you're out, uh sailing and you're sailing over towards britannia and the wind's coming out of the east usually means it's raining or it's going to rain soon but when the wind's coming out of the east in britannia uh, or a better example in the middle of the summer you're just sailing up river and the winds are coming off the south and they're really gusty and you can see those dark spots of water come across and they hit you and you heel over and then they go by and you come back up and you keep going so when the wind is coming from the south and it's gusty and strong boat gets leaned over but it comes back up and it's not really all that unpleasant right you don't feel like oh this is not i don't like this i have to do something to deal with it that's because there's no waves because there's no fetch right the wind hits the water and in less than half a mile it's at your boat and it hasn't had time to really build up any waves so wind without waves is you still have all the forces issues but you don't have any of the wave dynamics that make it unpleasant if you're trying to sail up to uh maybe to canada sailing club or uh uh, or up to Porta Call Marina, and there's a 20 knot wind coming straight down the river. That's not the same experience as that 20 knot wind coming off the south shore. Now you're sailing into waves, you're, you're pounding, it's wet, uh, it's noisy, it's cold. So the direction that, uh, that your waves are relative to how you're trying to sail also make a big difference. It's good. We're having a slight tech uh, delay with the video. So we've, we're wondering if, if everyone could not use the NSC Wi-Fi. If you're using it on your phone, you're connected to NSC Wi-Fi, if you could turn it off. We're thinking that might help uh, the stream or whatever be a little more clear. Item number two is we're gonna pass the pictures around for in-room donations uh, for the Legacy Fund. Okay, thank you. Uh, so uh, nearby land, uh, changes wave, changes in water depth. Uh, they all can affect wave direction and confused waves are, are, are not fun to sail in either. Um, so that's, that's how waves contribute to, to big, big air, heavy air sailing being more exciting than, than flat water sailing. And that's, that's the conditions we have to deal with for, uh, for heavy air sailing. Before I, I go on and talk about uh, boat factors in heavy air sailing, does anybody have any questions or observations on, on the environment and how, how different it can be? I see two. So I think they want you to get up to the microphone and ask the question there so that the people who are doing this online can see as well or hear you as well. Without a physics lesson, just one quick reason why uh, the uh, the force is exponential for the sail, but not for the rudder. Just if there's an easy, easy, quick. Sure. So the the, the answer is um, it actually is exponential for the rudder. However, when you're uh, the forces the sail plan sees as a function of the wind speed that you're in, and the forces the rudder sees as a function of the water speed that you're in. So even though the wind is piped up to 20 knots, you're still only sailing at six knots. Okay. Go ahead. Two sort of observations or questions. I don't know which they are, but uh, with your upside down duck analogy, with the waves, um, weird things happen to your rudder. And weird things happen to your keel, especially in shallow water. Okay, when you're sailing through 
uh, heavy wind trying to get out of the water. You go to Elmer and things get shallow. I was on Lake Simcoe and all of a sudden, oh, I'm coming out of wave. I don't have a rudder because it's in the air. Yep. Okay, now I've got the rudder in the water and the forces on the sails and everything actually get larger than the exponential thing that you're talking about because all of a sudden you've got more force on the rudder and more force on the sails and, and then it goes away and comes back and that's really hard the other thing that happened while i was sailing in that sort of condition in lake ontario we snapped a shroud actually we didn't snap a shroud it pulled a uh the cleat out of the hull. Pulled the and, chain plate out of the yeah, hull. Yeah, completely. Yep. And went right past my face and went, okay. So what do you say about those situations? So so for sure, mm -hmm. uh, short choppy waves that are steep enough that you're, uh, you can get your uh, rudder out of the, out of the water. Uh, I've, I've, I, I've had short choppy waves sailing before. Uh, I've, I mean, not wood. Uh, I, I've never had it be a, the the a, the kind of problem where I was going to capsize or broach because of that. Um, but but for sure, if you if you get caught at, at the instant in time where your rudder is not in the water, so your keel will be in the water for sure when your rudder is not. Um, although I've I found some pictures of dinghies where that's not true, but that that's a pretty good launch. Um, uh, you're, it's only a problem if you need your rudder in that instant to to do something with the boat. Uh, and then, yeah, you're going to have to wait till your rudder gets put back in the water before you're going to be able to do anything about that. There's, you're, you're not going to steer with a rudder in the air, that's for sure. Uh, as for the, uh, the shroud coming off the boat, I'll, I'm, we're going to cover boat factors in the next section, but I will tell you, I, I've had a, a shroud fail on my boat as recently as March of last year. So, yeah. Goes with uh, my question. When you find yourself in square chop, like you're talking about, and you're trying to get out in, um, into a harbor, you need a, that rudder. So you have to depower your sails. So depowering your sails is not going to stop your rudder from coming out. The, the, the rudder is leaving the water not because of your sails, but because of the chop, the, the, because of the, the profile of the water that you're going over. So the, you, you can change direction so that you're not going over the waves so aggressively like this. Uh, you can sail across them to, to help minimize that. Just be careful. Uh, or you some, can turn some, downwind or go to a. Sometimes you ha don't have the uh, choice when you're coming into a harbor, though. <laughs> Fair enough. Uh, okay. And I, so happily, we've never had that experience here. You're lucky. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Thank you. Concur. Okay. Any anybody else? So the the environment is uh, is very dynamic. It's dynamic in a sailboat at five knots. It's dynamic at ten. It gets very dynamic as the wind speeds go past 15 knots. Um, all right, so boat factors in heavy air. So this is uh, so the, this is my sailing experience. I own an albacore, uh, that albacore actually. I just haven't sailed it in quite a while. Uh, I own a Viper. That's the one that the shroud, uh, the chain plate failed on me on the, the the port side of the boat there in March, and uh, and I don't own a Laser 28, but I've done a fair bit of racing in one. Uh, so that, that's my experience with boats. And uh, when we talk about boats, a uh, couple of items that come to mind right away. Maintenance is one. And uh, we just had a question about what happens when you lose your shroud. And the answer is you shouldn't be out if you're going to lose your shroud. Uh, but I lost my shroud too. So that you, you, you can sometimes not know. And the funny thing is we did a repair to the boat just before we went to the regatta. And the repair held. And it failed all around the repair. And I, I pulled it all apart. It was pretty catastrophic. Um, then adequate controls and adequate controls. People would think like, well, I have a bang, I have a note hall, I have a Cunningham, but are they strong enough to pull on with the purchase you need when your loads go up in wind strength? That's the question there. Uh, your sails, uh, your motor, and then we'll talk a little bit about what different displacement boats, um, how different displacement boats are going to deal with big breeze. So, <clears throat> So maintenance, that, uh, that I, I grabbed this picture off the web, but I, I kind of liked it. I haven't got my glasses on. I can look up there, but then you can't hear me. 
Um, I grabbed this picture off the web because it's not a new boat and it was a for sale thing, some 29 foot boat. But when I looked at it, I said, that guy took time to make sure all of the, uh, all the sail controls work. Uh, everything leads pretty fair. Uh, the lines look like they're in good condition. The blocks all look like they're in good condition. The lines look like they're probably the right size for the job they're doing. And the blocks are also the right size for the job they're doing. So that's someone who kept his boat up. That boat, I, I haven't seen the hull, but based on what I see on the top of the cabin there, I'd be willing to go out and sail on that boat in pretty big breeze because uh, the person looks like they took proper care of it. Um, so the, the quote, everything works on your boat. I, I've sailed with, uh, with a number of people. Uh, so the picture you saw previously, that's myself and another member of the club, Harvey Barnes, uh, sailing my albacore. And I've had other guests sail, guest crew in my albacore as well. Uh, some of them have been pretty experienced sailors and, uh, and I'm surprised it, it's happened four or five times that, uh, that we're sailing along and, and they'll say, Van, everything on your boat works. Yep. Yeah. So, and I, I'm, I'm taken aback by that. And I'm like, well, the first time it happened, I was quite surprised. I said, well, what do you mean? They said, well, everything works. I said, well, everything is supposed to work. They said, yeah, but not everything works on everybody else's boat. And, and so, uh, I was surprised by that. So then I started looking at other people's boats and I would realize that, oh, they don't have good blocks. They don't have the appropriate size lines. And, uh, maybe that cleat won't hold when it has to. So that's, that's, the, everything works. Everything needs to work on your boat. If you're going to get, if you're going up weather up river and it looks like the conditions are not going to be nice or could get gnarly, or if you're going to go out for a Tuesday night race with the possibility of a squall coming through, or you're going to go on a weekend regatta and Saturday is going to blow the dog off the chain. Everything on your boat needs to work, right? Cause uh, if it doesn't, you're not going to have fun. You, you can still not have fun if the weather's miserable enough with everything working, but if everything doesn't work, I guarantee you, you will not have fun. Um, yeah, it's key for any sailing, but it's especially true for heavy air sailing. So if you look at your boat and say, well, outhaul doesn't work very good, but it holds most of the time. That's not a good outhaul for big wind. Uh, similarly with your Cunningham, similarly with your main sheet, basically everything, uh, clutches that slip when the loads go up on them, those need to get fixed or you need to put a better line in them so that they hold. Uh, because in heavy air, when you want to crank that, uh, halyard as tight as you possibly can, you don't want it to slip. Ah, so that includes your standing and running rigging. Your blocks should all turn. Your cleats should all cleat. Your winches should all work like they're supposed to. Things that are supposed to slide on tracks are supposed to be able to slide. Your motor should run when you want to turn it on. Uh, if you have pumps in your boat, especially a bilge pump, it should work. Especially in, in, in big wind and big waves, water's going to get into your bilge. I guarantee it, no matter how good, you've, how good a job you think you've done of waterproofing things, Water's going to get in your bilge. You want your pumps to work. Uh, hatches, when you close them, they shouldn't leak. Uh, furlers, uh, so one of the, the easiest things to do in big breeze is furl your jib. Uh, but your furler has to work, right? And if it doesn't work, then you're, you're stuck with a lot of sail out sometimes. Uh, your radio should work for obvious reasons. Uh, not just to call for help, to hear a call for help. And, uh, and your safety gear, right? Uh, People rarely fall over in five knots of breeze. It's usually at the most inopportune time, most inconvenient time. We've just rounded the mark. We're going down when we're doing great and someone fell off the boat. Damn. So you want to make sure you've got the gear to throw over to that person while you get your spinnaker down. And he's your best spinnaker dowser that went over the back of the boat, of course. Uh, so it's going to take an extra five minutes. And then you've got to come back up and try to find the guy. So having the safety gear on the boat for those conditions is an important thing. Um, some, some general things that I'll, I'll pass along because I, I don't think they're common knowledge. Um, but uh, when you size lines and blocks, um, you should size your line so that your, or your blocks so that they're 10 times the diameter of your line. So if you're turning a six or an eight millimeter, say, we'll say a six millimeter line around a block, that block should be 60 millimeters in diameter of the shoe. Um, if you're turning a, a half inch line, which is like a 12 millimeter line, around a block, it should be a 120 millimeter block. That, that's getting a little crazy, but it should be a 100 millimeter block. Uh, and the, the tighter diameter you turn that line on the block, the more friction you get in your system. Uh, I, don't have my, I haven't had my albacore here for years, but everybody that looks at it says your lines are so small. Why are your lines so small? 
And the answer is because there's no friction, so they're easy to pull. And I've had a lot of people tell me, well, I like to have a bigger line because it's more comfortable in my hand. True, but you have to pull so much harder on that big line. Or you have to make all your blocks bigger. Uh, the number of times I've seen people at the Chandlery go in and come out with a whole bunch of six millimeter line and a whole bunch of 29 millimeter blocks. And that's five to one is the ratio. And I'm telling you, when you rig that system up, it's gonna be a lot of friction in it. And you won't notice the friction in five knots of breeze and you probably won't notice it in 10, but you'll notice it in 15 and it'll limit how far you can pull things in at 20. So you, you wanna make sure that your boat is rigged properly. The block sizes are the right, the blocks are the right sizes. If you've got a shiv that doesn't turn in, in your, your car on your deck, and you think, well, it's not a big deal. I got a big winch back here to deal with that. Yes, but there's a lot more friction because you're, you're pulling it around that shiv and having instead of having the shiv turn. So just replace it. You either replace the whole car or put a ball bearing one in there. Uh, make everything work, make it all work easy. Sailing will be more pleasant even when it's not blowing heavy. Controls. So I, I spoke a little bit about this stuff already when I talked about minimal friction, but do you have enough purchase on your control system? So this is actually uh, the line drawing for the Vang that, uh, that is in my albacore and is in just about every racing albacore that, uh, uh, that, that is raced. Every albacore that's raced, let's put it that way. Um, and it, it gives a 16 to 1 purchase on a boom bang. <clears throat> uh, so that's, that's, that's a lot of purchase, right? You, if, you, if I pull as hard as I can, I can pull about 50 pounds. 16 to 1 would mean 800 pounds pulled between the, uh, the, the vang and the bottom of the mast. There's friction, so it's not 800 pounds, but it's probably 500. So, and I pull my vang as hard as I can when I'm in an albacore in big, big breeze. Uh, so if you have an 8 to 1 vang, you have to pull twice as hard as I do. And I'm a pretty burly guy, so you should be very burly. Uh, and if you have a four to one Vang, you got no chance. So when you need that, and the Vang is probably the biggest depowering, the most, the most important depowering control on a dinghy. And if you don't have enough purchase in it, and if it doesn't run smooth, you're not gonna have fun in big, with big wind because you can't trim your sails properly. So having sufficient purchase is important. Minimal friction, I already spoke about that. You, you wanna have the best ball bearing blocks you can buy. And as soon as you don't hear the, the bearing spin when in that block, you need to swap it out for one where the bearings spin. And again, you want as close to 10 to one as you can get between the diameter of your sheaves and the diameter of the lines they go through. Maximum hold, that goes to cleats. Uh, when, you're, when you're talking about purchase systems where you're pulling it by hand, Almost any cleat will do. We think we're strong, but if the cleat will hold 150 pounds, it'll hold what we'll pull, no problem at all. Uh, but if you don't have a purchase system, if you have clutches on your boat, on your cabin top, and, uh, and as I said, they start to slip when the winds go up and you try to crank something in really hard and it gives back two inches every time you do that, you need to swap the teeth on your clutch. You need to swap your clutch or you need to swap your line. It, it might be all three. Uh, but you, you need to, to fix it so that when you crank it in tight, it stays tight. Um, and then clear working area. Um, if you look on the drawing, you can see uh, there's a, well, I, can, I can't point, can I? No, I can't. So there you go. There's, that's the one cleat. So this way, this is the perch, this is the loaded side. And the lines that go back here, these are unloaded. And this is the other cleat. So th this system lets you adjust the, the vang from either side of the boat. And, and the, the line that you're pulling on is continuous. It doesn't have an end. And it's taken up with shock cords at the back of the boat, so there's no lines around your feet. Uh, and that's what I mean by clean working areas. So you're not going to step on a line and, and slip and fall in the boat, although you still can because the main sheet's down there. But you want to minimize it to the extent that you can. So the, the, the fewer lines you have kicking around that can trip you up or you can step on them and lose your footing, the better, especially in that dynamic, wavy environment. Um, and... Uh, yeah, and then if you if it's a line that's coming over the cabin top and, and you're not using it, you put it down your hatch so that it's, it's out of the way or you have a bag somewhere you can drop the ends in. You don't want them hanging around in the cockpit where they can get in the way or you can pull on the wrong one by mistake. Uh, so that, that, that's controls. They should all work. Uh, they, they should all work well and they should all be relatively clean when they're not in use so they can be out of the way and not, not be a hazard. Uh, sales. So that particular set of sails is in very good repair, but you don't need sails that good to go racing, or sorry, not to go racing, to go sailing in big air. 
Uh, you don't need that good to go racing either. I don't sail with sails that good when I go racing, unless I'm going to regatta. Then I use my good sails. Um, but you do need to have sails that are not completely blown out. Uh, if you put your sails up, you pull every control on your boat as tight as you possibly can, and you look up and your sail is exactly the same shape as it was before you started, that's not a good enough sail to go sailing in big wind. <coughs> oh, excuse me. You, uh, you, you want to be able to, uh, to shape your sail with your sail controls. Uh, so it doesn't have to be a new sail for that, but it has to have some life left in it. Um, if you're sailing with Dacron sails and they're well used and they're more than 10 years old, you're probably not getting much, if, much effect from using your sail controls to try to make those better. Um, yeah, that's, that's about it for that. Uh, make sure they're the appropriate size. So if you're, if you're in a, a light displacement dinghy or, a, or a, a keel boat where you only have one jib and you only have one main and there's no reef points, well, your sail area is your sail area. But if you're in a, a, a larger keel boat or a cruising boat where you have different head sails, you have one or two reef points in your main, uh, you, can, you can have a very big impact on how enjoyable your sail is by making decisions before you get around the breakwater. Excuse me. If you, uh, if you decide that you're going to, uh, to go out in a day when things look pretty sporty out there and you think to yourself, I'm just going to sail it with what I've got up and I'll decide what to do after I get out there, uh, that's not going to be fun. You want to make a decision now about how bad could it be out there. And by bad, I mean how strong could the wind be. And I, I want to put up the right amount of sail or put the right amount of sail on my poles for those conditions. And if I get out there and I find, well, I'm a little bit underpowered and I, I can't go through the waves as well as I'd like, then you can shake out a reef. Uh, but it's easier to shake out a reef than it is to put one in. And it's uh, a lot easier to go out there with a small head sail and think, well, maybe I wanted a bigger head sail than it is to go out there with a big head sail and think, oh, I'd really like to have a smaller one because those big ones are hard to manage once they're up. Uh, so, so make sure your, your sail size is appropriate for the environment you think you're going to be in. If you see a squall coming down the river, get your sails down. I've done that. I, we finished a race here two seasons ago and I looked behind me at the big black cloud that was coming. And <clears throat> normally when we finished the race, I was sailing with my sons and I give the helm to one of them. And they both, they both looked at me when the race was over and said, can we? I said, nope, get the sails down quick as we can. Let's go. And they, they, they didn't ask why. They're, they're good like that. And I didn't want to show them the cloud that was coming because I didn't want them to get nervous. But we just had the jib rolled and put on the deck of the boat when the, the squall hit. And the boats that had been coming behind us and hadn't taken their sails down were out of control. It was, uh, it was, it was a 30-plus knot squall, and it lasted five, seven minutes. So, again, nobody died. I don't think anything got broken even. But it's a much more pleasant experience motoring back with the wind blowing over the boat than it is being on your ear with your sails up because you didn't see the squall coming. So make sure you have the right amount of sail up for the conditions that you're in. Change early. I spoke, already spoke about that. You know, change before you go out if you think you, you know the environment that well. And then plan ahead, same thing. Motor, if you have one, it needs to work. And the second bullet's important too because I know people who say, well, it works sometimes. No, it needs to work reliably. Because right? if it doesn't work reliably, the time you need it will be the time it doesn't work. So, so that's, uh, that picture has nothing to do with motors. But I really liked it. It's an, 18, it's an Aussie 18-foot skiff, and they're going. Uh, they don't need a motor. Uh, uh, but, yeah, if you have one, it should work. It should work reliably. So I have a little two-horsepower propane uh, outboard on the back of my boat, and it works reliably. And I can take a spare tank of, well, it's just like a little one can cylinder of propane. It's always in my locker. So I always have spare gas for it and I mean, not wood. It's, it's, it's always started reliably. I get it serviced in the spring and then we're, we're happy for the whole season. You should do the same thing, right? And especially if you think you're going to be going, going to go out and try things in more interesting conditions. Everything needs to work. Displacement. So I, I put the same three pictures up. Again, this is my albacore. That's as light displacement as you're going to get. Uh, Viper, it does have a keel. It's not a very heavy keel, so 115 kilos, I think. Uh, but it's still a pretty light displacement. And in the 28-foot uh, keel boat class, the laser would not qualify as a heavy displacement boat either. Um, so the boat type you, will affect, you have will affect uh, how well you can accommodate heavy air. Uh, light boats rely more on depowering the rigs and their sail plans. All right, sorry, and sail trim. Medium displacement boats, you can often adjust rigs, 
trim sails, and sometimes you can also reduce sail. And then heavy displacement boats, you're going to rely a lot more on sail trim and uh, and sail changes than you will on changing the rig. Do you know what I mean by changing the rig? Okay, I didn't see a whole bunch of heads nods, so I'll just talk about that a little bit. Uh, yes, so uh, uh, tuning the rig is uh, is things like uh, adjusting the tension on your shrouds. Uh, some boats, like my albacore there, I've got, I've got an adjustable jib halyard on that. So I can, I can ease the jib halyard to rake the mast back, or I can pull the jib halyard tight to take uh, sag out of the luff of the jib. Uh, so you, you can, and, and your mast are also in the lighter displacement. Boats are quite dynamic. You can bend them quite a bit. Uh, in my albacore, uh, if I crank my vang as tight as I can pull it, remember that's a 16 to 1 vang, so when I crank that all the way, I can push my mast at the partners where they come through the deck there. I can push it forward about four inches. And where the gooseneck is, it's forward about six inches. And my sail has all these wrinkles in them because I've overstretched it. So when, you're, when your sailmaker cuts a, a, a mainsail for you, he cuts it with a certain curve in the front. And then when you put that on your mast, because your mast is curved less than that sail, that curve that your sailmaker puts in the luff, when you put that on your straight mast, it gives you some depth in your sail. That's draft. And that's that's what makes it look like a wing. That's where you get your lift. So if you're in a boat where you can actually control how much you bend your mast and you bend it way more than your sailmaker was anticipating it would be bent when he cut the sail, you're flattening your sail out. And a flat sail has low drag. It also has less lift, but lift is not a problem in big wind. Drag is the problem. You're going to have lots of lift. So you want to be flattening it out so it has left drag, less drag. That's what I mean by adjusting your, your rig. If you can bend your mast, if you can uh, adjust your rake dynamically, then you can change the shape of your sails, and that can really help you control, deal with the excess power you have in your sail plant. Uh, if you're in a heavier displacement boat or in a boat where you don't have those options to bend the mast by pulling on things inside the boat in real time, then you have to do things like reduce sail because that's really your only option to, to, to limit how much drag you're getting from your sail plant. So that's what I mean by that. Does that make sense, Mike? Okay. Um, and I think that was it. So that, that's, that's what I have to say about boats. Uh, I'll be happy to take questions on boats if anybody has any. Um, there's no way I did that good at a job of explaining boats. No? Do we have any questions from online? I didn't ask that for the first section, sorry. Okay. Okay. Whew. So you're in heavy air and you got a lot of rolling breakers coming down on you. Are you going upwind or downwind? Well, you're heading up into the wind. Okay. Uh, and it's, it's, you're really getting hammered. Yep. What do you do? Which, what, what do you think is the best thing to do? That's, that's my question. Okay, so that's a sailing question as opposed to a boat question, but I'll take it. Um, so, I mean, the answer is it depends, right? Um, or, or what kind of boat are you sailing in? Panzer 27. Um, so that's a pretty light displacement boat, and it's pretty well canvassed, I think, if I remember the boat correctly. Okay, so do you have all your canvas up? So, so that, that's it, the, the waves, the, the waves play a role, but it's how much power is in your sail plan is, is decides whether you're pounding or whether you're just going over the waves. So if you can reduce your sail area, either furl your, your jib or change it to a smaller one, uh, or, or drop your main down, uh, is your, is your main up? Do you have your, uh, all your control should be pulled as tight as they can. Uh, do you have a traveler on that boat? I think you do. So is your traveler down to the bottom corner? Uh, so, so your if your so your main sheet can be in tight. That's okay, but your traveler itself should be dropped quite a bit. Should be almost on the as far down as it can go, actually, because you you when your your traveler basically so think about your your mainsail like a wing, and and your traveler controls the angle of attack of your your uh, your mainsail to the air, and the bigger angle of attack you have, the more lift you have, and the more lift you have, the more drag you get. So in, in big, big breeze, if you've pulled everything up, I mean, you, you should be on your ear at that point because you got a lot of sail area. 
and you're, you're taking a lot more power out of the wind than you can ever use effectively. So you need to drop your traveler down. You have a backstay, I'm sure you do. And you're, you're, yeah, your backstay needs to be cranked as, as, as much as you can. Uh, so that's, it's pretty common to have uh, one tack that's bumpy and one tack that's not. If you can stay on the non-bumpy tack for the whole sail, that's great. But on our river, that's usually, you usually find a riverbank before you get where you want to go. So you're kind of obliged to go some, some time on the other tack as well. Um, uh, yeah, so tacking. Now, what, what will make a difference is uh, like in the middle of the river, the waves tend to be bigger. So if you can make your way across that on the smooth tack and then maybe stay on the side that isn't so bad, because usually if, 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 you can, if you can pick the side where the waves aren't so bad, and get to it, then you can you can sail up the side that avoids the, the the worst of the waves. The the distance between the waves changes a little bit as the 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 depth of the water underneath changes. So sometimes you can be sailing in a spot where it's not pleasant because the, the wavelength matches your boat perfectly. So you're digging your bow in every wave. If you come back across the same spot half a mile up where the river's maybe 15 feet deeper, it won't be so bad. So you certainly can tack to the other other direction. But if you're racing and you need to get around the mark up there, you're going to, have to spend half your time on one tack and half your time on the other. Um, then you're, you're, you're not going to have the luxury of saying, well, I'm just going to sail on the comfortable side. Uh, and when we're racing like that, I tend to make most of my gains on the bumpy side than on the smooth side. Because everybody goes fast on the smooth side. It's how to deal with the bumpy side that separates the, uh, the, the people who are like big wind from the people who don't. Okay. Nothing else? Uh, all right, so let's talk about crew factors in heavy air. So your crew, uh, their experience, their competency, appropriate size, so that's ambiguous intentionally, uh, their fitness and their health, and then your clothing. So uh, experience and competency. So we don't just want to talk about length of time you've been sailing, but how much time have you been sailing in strong winds in a similar type of boat? Uh, until you've been there and done that, you haven't been there and done that. And, uh, and when you need to have been in some, had some kind of responsibility on the boat in those conditions, right? Uh, holding a bucket at the back corner while we were sailing. And that's not the same as I was trimming the sail or I was steering through the waves in the big wind. So it, it, when you're looking to put together a crew and you want to go out in those kinds of conditions, try to find at least some people who have experience doing that already. Uh, racing experience usually means more knowledge with sail trim and rig tuning than cruising experience just because Racers really care how fast we can go. And, and being able to go fast in big breeze is dealing with all the adverse factors of minimizing them so that you can keep your boat going well. Um, uh, are you a line puller or were you a sail trimmer? Do you understand what I mean when I, that question? So uh, when, I, when I crew with my 10-year-old, uh, they pull lines and I say, cleat it there. And, uh, and now that I'm sailing with my 16 year old and my 18 year old, I don't have to say that anymore. Now I just say trim the sail and they can trim the sail. So if you've been out in big breeze before and you held the line, but you weren't the person responsible for deciding if it was in the right position or not, you were a line puller. If you're the person who said it's where it needs to be now, you were the trimmer. So there's a different level of knowledge required for those two things. Um, uh, boat balance. So. That's, uh, that's, again, are you okay standing on your two feet in a dynamic environment, right? Boat does this, boat does this a lot, and you have to be able to trim sails or, or do whatever your job is while standing on the boat doing that stuff. And, uh, and how aware are you of the dangers that are on the boat? Right? Their boats aren't that dangerous at five knots. You can get a finger stuck in something, but it's not that bad. At 10 knots, if you're not watching what you're doing, the boom can give you a nasty knock. At 20 knots, damn near everything on the boat can hurt you if you're not careful. So you want people on the boat who are aware of the fact that when I let go of that clutch, if I don't have the number of turns on the winch that are needed, bad things are going to happen in the cockpit. Um, and, and so you, you want to make sure you pick people who aren't going to put you well, themselves first and then anybody else on the boat in danger because they don't know what they're doing there. Appropriate size. Refers to overall number of crew and the physical size of the crew members. Uh, heavy air is not a good place to practice sailing shorthanded unless you're already really good at sailing with a full crew. 
So if you have a 32 foot boat and you think you're going to sail up river in 25 knots of breeze with you and your spouse, and you've had the boat for two years, that might be a bad decision. You might regret that before the day's out. Uh, <clears throat> that's if your spouse is still talking to you. <laughs> <clears throat> Excuse me. So you want to make sure that you know how to sail the boat in eight knots of breeze before you try to do it in 18. You want to make sure you have enough crew to do all the jobs that need to get done uh, on the boat. And, and you want to make sure that they know their jobs. Uh, coordinating trimming activities is an important part of good boat handling. Uh, it's an essential part of heavy air boat handling. handling. So uh, we're going to talk about tacking when we come to the next section. But when you, when you tack in five or six knots of breeze, and the person who's letting the sheet off the loaded winch, uh, if they don't do it at the right time, like if they do it early, at five knots, nobody cares. Even at eight knots, nobody cares. But, and if they do it late, same thing, nobody cares, right? The sail backwinds a little bit, you let it off and life is good. If you backwind a, like a, a Genoa in 18 knots of breeze and it's still stuck on the winch, that's not good, right? Your boat's gonna go over. Uh, in fact, I've, uh, the second season sailing of Viper, I didn't, I didn't own one at the time I was crewing one. And uh, we, we tacked, and the winds were out of the east, and they were really strong, like 20, 20 to 25 knots. And, uh, and the way the cleat on the jib works on a Viper is uh, sometimes they recleat. And during our tack, it recleated. And uh, we broached, like mast in the water. And then because the Viper is such a light boat and it floats so high, there was enough windage to push us full turtle. So, so you want to make sure that people do the things they're supposed to do at the right times, and they don't do the things they're not supposed to do at the wrong times when you're sailing in big breeze. Uh, yeah, right number and size of crew is important. So I talk about physically size of the crew. So I'm, I'm a heavy guy. I have been for quite a while. So when I sail my albacore, and the ideal crew weight for an albacore is about 340 to 360 pounds. So that leaves room for 120 to 140 pounds on my albacore. And so that's not a physically big person, right? That's a physically pretty small person. But in an albacore, the jib is about 35 square feet. So just about anybody who's 120 pounds can pull that jib in, no matter how bad the wind gets. If you were the 120 pound person at the back and you thought you could take my 120 pound crew in the front of the boat and go sailing in that albacore in the same wind conditions that, that her and I sailed in, you might have a hard time because you're missing 100 pounds. And 100 pounds in a dinghy is a big deal. Uh, so, so just because that person was the, exactly the right crew for one boat won't make them the right crew for all the boats. Um, if you're the person cranking the witch in on a 30-foot keel boat in big breeze, you're a lot closer to my size than you are to a 120-pound person. And if you put a 120-pound person on the winch, there's a mechanical advantage and they will get it in, but you should be planning for it to take a lot, lot longer. Uh, and, and so that's, that's a factor. I mean, if you're, if you have all day and all the river to make your tack and finish it in, that's fine. But if you're going to be in close quarters with other boats, speed matters. You should make sure that the people doing the jobs on the boat are sufficiently large and sufficiently strong enough for them or vice versa, sufficiently small and sufficiently light enough for them too. Cause there are jobs where you should be small and light, right? The person who packs a spinnaker on a big wind day where you're going back up wind, that person's in the bottom of the boat while you're packing. You want that to be the smallest person you can possibly get. But you don't want that person to be uh, uh, sheeting your jib in when you're going back up with. So fitness and health. Uh, sailing in physical, uh, sailing in heavy air is physically demanding. Uh, boats pitch and heel a lot. Uh, I, as we already said, the loads on the sheets get quite high. Uh, <laughs> I was generous with that. Some work is done in non-optimal leverage conditions. So again, when the boat's flat, you have space and time to do it. You brace your feet, you put yourself over the winch. It's more or less flat. You can really use your, your strength and your, your, uh, your weight to your advantage to crank something in. When the boat's already healed at 30 degrees, one foot is being dragged through the water because the gunnel is already under it. Uh, and uh, it's noisy and windy and the, the skipper's yelling at you that you're taking too long it's a lot harder to get the, the, uh, the jib cranked in. Uh, so, so you, you want to be sufficiently fit, uh, healthy and, and strong enough to, to, to do that in challenging conditions. Uh, your best crew with a broken hand is no longer your best crew. Like you, you need two good working hands. If you get a finger caught in the winch, you're done. That's it. You're no matter what you think you can do, you're done. Uh, 
uh, health can change while sailing. And usually when that happens, it's not for the better, right? If you're the green person in the back with the bucket or you've taken the boom in the head, uh, you're no longer effective. And, and as soon as that happens, you need to reassess if you're in the right spot with the people that you have and the boat that you have. Um, and, and that can turn your, your best crew into your, your biggest liability. So, so be aware of that. Uh, in, in case of injury to one of the crew, can the rest of the crew get the boat back to the shore? So if you're, if you're an experienced sailor and you're taking out four beginners and you're going to go out and sail in big, big breeze, you might want to reconsider that and maybe bring out at least one other experienced sailor with you so one of you can get the boat back if something happens to you. Uh, and heaven forbid you're the person that falls over the back, right? You don't want the four people who are just learning how to sail to say, oh, now what do we do? So you, you, you don't want to put yourself in that situation. You don't want to do that in five knots of breeze either, but at least you can yell at them and tell them what to do to turn the boat around. In 15 knots of breeze, they're not going to hear you. So you, you, you want to make sure you've got enough people on the boat to do the things that you want done safely. Clothing is very important. Uh, it's not important in July and two o'clock in the afternoon and eight knots of breeze, but it's very important when the wind pipes up. Clothes make it the man or the sailor in our case. Right? Again, it's not important how you dress on a sunny afternoon in July, but for sailing in a blustery day in October, the clothes you have on make a big difference to your experience. Right? You need to be warm. You need to be dry. Uh, you need to be able to stand on a pitching and rolling boat, so having good footwear is important. Uh, you need to handle lines and clutches, so having gloves is important. And, uh, and you need to see the environment around you. Um, you also need to see the wind on the water uh, if you're going to be sailing in in heavy air conditions. And so if you see the gust coming to your boat, you've already dealt with it in your head before it gets there. And if you don't see it coming and it surprises you, you're going to be on your ear because you, you, you can't react fast enough if you don't see it. So having the kind of uh, eyewear, polarized is the right answer for that, where you can actually see the wind coming across the water to you uh, and having your crew have polarized glasses on and calling the wind for you if you're the person at the back steering or trimming the sails makes a big difference to how well you go upwind. Uh, same thing downwind, actually, because uh, uh, we have an asymmetric spinnaker on our boats, and if we get caught in a gust that we didn't know, we broach uh, pretty violently. Uh, yeah, very violently sometimes. Uh, so, again, you want that person who's looking out of the boat calling wind for you to be able to see it, and uh, having glasses on is very helpful for that. I think that's it for this section. That is it for this section. So um, any questions on this? Most of this stuff is, I would call it common sense, actually. OK, uh, Van, we have a question from Ken Saunderson. He asks, I'm confused about what sail drag is and does. Okay, um, so I, I, I almost put that slide in actually. Um, uh, if you guys, if you picture a, a wing as a curved shape like this, yours, it could be your sail if it's in that shape, and lift as a force on a wing is what makes it want to go that way, and drag on the, uh, as a force on a wing is what, is what goes out the back. So it, it's actually, it's pulling you sideways. So, uh, so when you turn your, your sail up like this, lift is, it, the, the resultant vector, sorry for the engineering speak, is actually a little forward of a beam, but uh, it's, it's mostly, when you're going up, when it's mostly a beam and a little bit forward, and drag is out the back. So you, as you increase drag, your, your sail doesn't want, you don't want to go through the, the air as fast, and it also uh, heals you over a little bit more. So, so drag is a bad thing in any environment. In light air, you don't care about it because you want to get as much lift out of your sail as you possibly can. But as soon as you have full power in your sail plan, 8 to 11 knots, depending on the boat that you're in, um, any more power is, is not helping you go faster. But drag goes up as well as your, your uh, lift, and the, and the drag is bad. Did, did that do it? I can, I can do a better job with a whiteboard, but then I don't think we want to go there. Correct. Sorry, uh, I, 
gentleman at the front said that uh, drag is also a, a, a directly correlated to the depth of your sail. And, and he's absolutely right. And uh, I use this analogy all the time when I talk to people about flattening their sails. Uh, if you think about military airplanes and you think about uh, a freighter, uh, something that uh, a, a, a troop transport, something that's meant to carry a lot of load, like a C-130 Hercules, they have a really fat wing. That's because they want to make a lot of lift at low speed. Uh, you take a, a fighter plane and they have a really, really thin wing, and that's because they fly at much higher speeds and they don't want drag because drag prevents them from going fast. So when you're sailing in light air, having a C-130 wing, a nice deep draft in your sail plan, that's desirable. You get a lot of power out of it. But as soon as you have enough power to go as fast as your boat can go through the, through the water, you don't want any more power. Now you just want to minimize drag. So as you get more velocity over your sails, you're going to try to change the shape of them as much as you can because you're not looking for more lift now. Now you're looking for less drag and less drag and less drag. So it stops, to become, it stops becoming about creating more lift in my sail plan and becomes 100% about reducing the drag that I'm creating in my sail plan. Got another one here from YouTube. Uh, what should we do if we are in a high performance sail dinghy, F-18 tornado, and a 30 to 35 knot squall arrives suddenly, especially if we are too far to come back to the dock? And he adds, the best option is to plan a place to stop, but what should I do if it happens too suddenly on the river? So there's a little scenario. So pray. <laughs> uh, no, uh, so uh, I'll, I'll, I'll say this in all honesty, right? So if that's a squall, squalls don't last all day, right? They, they go through. So, um, if you're, so if you're going out in a very high performance dinghy, then you should be going out dressed like we were in the earlier slides there with all that sailing gear on. And if you're dressed like that, and, and you should also be going out dressed so that you can be immersed in the water. And, and if, if if it goes to hell in a handbasket, capsize the boat, sit on the hull, and wait, right? Because you're, you're only going to drift downwind at a certain speed. Mind you, a cat with a lot of windage might go a little faster than a dinghy would. Uh, but still, it, you'll, you'll drift ashore. If the concern is, I could hurt myself if I keep the boat upright and I sail, because there's no way in 35 knots of breeze that boat's going to do anything except Mach 2, right? You can turn it dead downwind and use the sail like a barn door. You're still going to do Mach 2. Uh, so if you don't want to go through the water that fast, capsize it and wait. Uh, and either the squall will go through, someone will come and rescue you. Uh, I, I don't, I, have we all had the experience of watching the fire department pull up, put their rib in the water and go off to get people off of uh, the shoal over there at Britannia or, or other parts of the river? So the, there's enough people watching the water. They'll call for help if, you, if you're stuck like that. Um, there's a point where no matter how competent you are, there's more wind than you want. Drop sails, uh, throw out a sea anchor, throw something overboard to, to to slow you down, and just wait it out. That's you don't want to get caught in that environment. So a thirty-five knot squall that comes through by surprise usually means you didn't check the weather before you left, uh, and that's a that's kind of a no-no, right? You're, uh, you you should I I religiously check the weather before I come down, and, and everybody that you shouldn't make that a habit. Have you ever um, used a twist in the sail, uh, ease the vang, bring the uh, traveler uh, windward, and spill the uh, wind off the top of the sail while keeping your lift uh, on the bottom of the sail? So yes, kind of. Um, I, I'm okay easing my sheet, but I'm not okay easing my vang. So re remember the boats I sail, right? They all have a very bendy mast. So So... If I ease my vang, I'm straightening out my mast. And if I'm straightening out my mast, I'm putting more power in my, my main, and I don't want to do that. So they do talk about twisting off the top of our sails. And I will say that on a boat with a, a backstay, you have a big advantage over one over me. I don't have a backstay in any of my boats. Okay, that makes sense. Uh, so if you have a backstay, you crank your vang, uh, especially if you're on a boat with a mast that you can actually bend by cranking the vang. Then you want to pull that thing as hard as you possibly can. Um, you, you can you can twist off your mainsail by easing your main sheet and keeping the vang on. You're still pushing the mast forward, but the the vang is is an okay control for closing the leach of your sail. Doesn't do the same job your main sheet does. Your main sheet's much better at it. Yeah. 
Yeah. So if you want to twist off the top of the sail a little bit, just ease your main sheet a bit. You don't have to let it completely off. It's it, it, it's really like it's inches how much you have. To, and I don't mean an inch of main sheet. I mean an inch of distance between the blocks. So if you got a six to one bang, it's six inches to get that one inch off. Uh, sorry, a six to one main sheet. It's six inches to get that one inch of travel between the blocks. And that will really open the top of your main quite a bit. But you can keep the main sheet cranked, pull the backstay and look up and you just watch the top of your leech fall off as you do that. So I would I would be twisting off the top of my sail by pulling my backstay, not by letting my main sail, my main sheet off. Uh, yeah. I, I would also have my traveler dropped all the way down in big breeze because there's no reason for it to be anywhere else. If you have a traveler, it should be like at the, the bottom part of the boat. Interesting. Thank you. Yep. Okay. Oh. So when you uh, go out um, on the weekends and uh, a number of uh, uh, cruises, you'll see some of the larger cruising boats just putting up a jib and sailing with that because they don't want to deal with uh, a mainsail um, on a windy day. Yeah, my my father-in-law sailed like that. My father-in-law sailed like that. Uh, his answer was, because uh, when I started to sail uh, back in 1990, 91, uh, my father-in-law had a CNC 36. So that's a pretty heavy displacement boat. And he had a 155 Genoa on it. And we were sailing the Bay of Islands in Newfoundland. And we'd go out and he'd put the Genoa up uh, for sailing on the weekends. But we raced on Wednesday nights. And on rain, Wednesday night race night, he'd always put the main up. And so I would ask him on the weekends, why don't we put the main up as well? Because I was new to sailing and I didn't know the answer to that question either. And he, he said exactly what you said at the microphone, right? It's a hassle to have the, you have to work of putting it up. You have to, to trim it. You have to adjust it. He said, and you get an extra knot, which is really not that important to him. Um, and, and of course, I was 21 at the time. And I said, what do you mean? Like an extra knot's a big deal. Uh, but, but it wasn't for him because we were just sailing out to an island and it didn't matter if we got there at uh, 205 or at 225. So, so yeah, if you're sailing in for pleasure and you just have your Genoa up, it will affect the center of effort in your sail plan. Uh, so your, your helm won't be balanced, like for sure. Uh, do you know what I mean when I say center of effort in the sail plan? Okay. Um, so if you just have your jib up and you don't have your main up, your center of effort's way for, it's somewhere in the jib, right? So it's forward of your mast. And so your, your bow is going to want to be pushed off quite a bit. And with no, no, uh, lift coming off the back of the main to counter that you're going to have a, a fair bit of weather helm to keep the bow of the boat up, but you're cruising you don't care how fast you're going or how high you point. It's fine. If you're sailing in really gnarly conditions, that's not good. Right, you want to have as balanced out. So, in gnarly conditions where your rudder might be out of the water because of the waves you go over, you don't want the boat to be wanting to bear off all the time because of your sail plan. You want things balanced so that when your rudder is not in the water, the boat doesn't want to round way down or round way up on you. It wants to track straight. So, to do that, you need to have both sails up, and they need to be pulling about the same amount each. Does that make sense? Okay. Okay. Uh, so, so boat handling is really short actually, because it's, it's only two things, right? It's tacking and driving. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I've never done the top one, but I've never sailed an I-14 either. I've seen I-14s do that. It's pretty spectacular. Uh, I've definitely done the middle picture many times, and I've been involved in the bottom picture once or twice as well. Uh, that's not fast. <clears throat> so, so steering a straight line is steering a straight line. It doesn't really matter how strong the wind is. It's the same kind of deal. You got to deal with the waves and you want to try to keep the boat on her feet. Uh, things get interesting and, and, uh, and the, the, the quality of the rest of the, so the quality of the helmsman matters for steering a straight line, going through the waves, et cetera. Uh, and, and it does take practice to become competent at that, but that's kind of fun. Actually, I, I liked it anyway. Uh, so you go out, you practice sailing a straight line. Oh God, I have to tack. Okay. <sharp inhale> Big noise. You tack. And now we sail a straight line again. It's, it's, it's pleasant. Everybody gets to relax the rest of the crew. Uh, and you focus on, on learning how to sail in big breeze. Tacking and driving requires the whole crew. And if you're going to do it well, it requires all the crew to do their jobs just so at just the right time. Uh, and <clears throat> if you're the driver of the boat instead of the crew, 
you can only steer the boat through the maneuver as quickly as your crew can do all the jobs that have to happen on the boat. So you can't just say, we're tacking, helm's over, and then you tack at the same speed you would every other day, and it's their job to make sure they do it as fast as they possibly can. I mean, that's an approach, it doesn't usually end well, right? You, 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 do have to, you have to coach them through it, you have to tack at a speed that lets them be successful at their jobs, and even if it might take two or three seconds longer to do it in a way that lets them be successful, them being successful is gonna make your tack a whole lot faster than you turning at the same speed and them not getting the job done right. So, and, and if that's true in tacking, it's even more true in driving. Because uh, especially if you happen to have a head sail up, but not a jib, but like a flying head sail up, you really have to go at the speed of the person on the, on the bow of the boat doing the work with your spinnaker pole. If you go faster than he goes, yeah, you're gonna fail. Hmm? Yeah, well, if, so if the person at the front knows what they're doing and you're going too fast, yes, you will definitely be told. Um, so tacking, I don't know what's written there because I don't have my glasses on. Um, so the, the key, key thing about tacking, two key things really for, for me on my boats, which are light displacement, so they don't carry a whole lot of momentum. First one, tack in a flat spot. Right, you do not want to attack, start attack as you're about to bury your bow in a wave because that's the time when you need the power from your sail plan to push you through it and out the other side. No matter how gnarly the conditions are, you can find a flat spot somewhere. Uh, when, I, when I tell my crew, get ready to attack, I'm already looking forward for the first flat spot. And when I see it, I, I, time, my, I, I time myself to it and I say two waves, one wave, tacking. So now my boys know, okay, here we go. Here's the flat spot and, and, and around we go. So always start your tack on a flat spot in the water. It doesn't have to be perfectly flat like a mirror lake. It just has to be not up like this and not down like that. Uh, and when you start your turn, you want to start it reasonably aggressive, especially if the flat spot's not going to last very long. And generally they don't. So you want to get through your turn as quickly as you can and, and, and on the other tack before you get buried in the next wave. So you release the jib when the jib sheet unloads. That is very important. If you're the person responsible for, for tacking the jib, you release the jib when the jib sheet unloads. When the jib sheet unloads, the jib is no longer driving the boat. So now if you let it go, it makes no difference to the person at the back if I've got power in my jib or not, because I've already steered too high, I have no power left in my sail plan. So if I release it before that happens, in moderate conditions, it's not the end of the world because the main wants to round the boat up anyway. And as soon as the jib comes off, it'll help you round up. But in big, 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 big wind conditions, you don't want to let it off too early. You want to keep the boat driving until you lose the power in the jib. Uh, and then when you get it over on the other tack, uh, if you're the driver, you want to turn down slow enough so that when you get to close hauled, if your jib's not all the way in, it's almost all the way in. If you go through the wind and come down quickly to a close hauled course and the people trimming your jib have not had a chance to get it in, once it starts to pull, it becomes very difficult to trim, right? You're gonna to need to be big, burly, strong person to get that jib in at any kind of a reasonable rate. And if you're, if you're racing and you've done this, you now can't point and you won't go fast until the jib's in. Whereas if you go through the wind and come down slowly and give them a chance to get the jib in, once once you're at the close haul course, if your jib's not all the way in, it's at least pulling pretty well, and you don't have to go down further to get the power. And they'll get it in quite quickly. So those are those are my two, I guess, tricks uh, for tacking: is uh, is release the jib when the jib sheet unloads, and get it in as quickly as you can when you're past head to wind. Uh, oh, and for the people going across to the cockpit the boom will be lower than it is in 10 knots of breeze because you've cranked everything as hard as you can. Uh, so beware of that. In a dinghy, this can, like, I actually have to release my vang before I attack because I'm old and I don't duck that far. <laughs> uh, so if I try to attack without releasing the vang, it, it, it can be embarrassing because like, oh, we're not tacking. Wait, wait, okay, vang off and then we tack again. So if you've cranked your vang hard enough that you're, uh, you're, 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 it's down almost at the gunnel of the boat at the back of the corner and you try to duck under that between there and the, the uh, centerboard trunk, yeah, that's not a lot of space there, especially with your life jacket on. So uh, just beware of that. And if that means you can't get under it, 
you should lift it up. Same thing if you've got your boom pulled way down and someone's going under the under the boom and over the cabin top. You want to might, might want to try that once or twice before it actually matters because with your life jacket on, you can be pretty thick body rolling under that boom. And if you don't fit, you're going to end up on the low side of the boat at the wrong time. That's tacking. Jibing. Uh, oh, wait. Can I go down? Uh, so the, sorry, there were, there were more things. Uh, find a flat spot. Don't surprise your crew. So I talked about that, right? Warning that we're going to attack soon. Looking for the flat spot. Here we go. Uh, best time. If you're, so if, I, I, this is a racing thing more than it is a cruising thing, but if, if you're overpowered and you want to spill some power from your sail, uh, you can move your jib car back and twist off the top. You keep the bottom of the jib powered up, you twist off the top of the jib. Uh, we, we talked about that with the mainsail. You can do the same thing with your jib, just pull the car back. It opens the top. It lowers the center of effort in the sail. It reduces your healing moment. It's a good thing generally. Uh, can't really do that while the jib's loaded up though, but a good time to do it is just as you tack. So you pull the car back, you tack, and now the, on, the, on the new tack, your, your, uh, your jib is not going to be as overpowered as it was before. And uh, yeah, beware of whipping sheets and lines. Uh, when, that jib sheet, when that jib starts to flog at the front of the boat, uh, it, well, I've seen people get hurt. So you, you want to be cognizant of that and not be close enough to it. If you're someone who, when the boat tacks, I'm just going to run around the front of the mast. Yeah, you don't want to do that in big breeze. That's going to be a bad place to be. There's a lot of things up there that can hurt you. So that's that. Driving. So I guess the, the first and foremost thing with a drive is that boom can hurt you. I mean, it can kill you. Uh, <clears throat> so be aware of the fact that it's going to start on one side of the boat. And when it starts the trip across, it accelerates very quickly. So you want to, I mean, the most dangerous thing you can do in a, in a boat in big breeze is an uncontrolled drive because people don't know what's coming. And if their heads are not down, someone's going to get hurt badly. So you want to be aware of that boom when it's out on one side, when it goes across, you duck. Even if you know that, and remember, it, well, when you're going downwind, it shouldn't be as low as when you're going upwind. But if someone forgot to release the bang when you went around the weather mark and it's still low, where you normally might miss your head by inches and you're not worried about it, it might not miss today. So, so just be aware of that. Uh, as the boom, so you're, you're sailing downwind, uh, you decide it's time to jibe, and you, you of course have to sail by the lee enough to get the wind on the other side of the boom, to the uh, other side of the sail to push it across. And even if you trim the, the, the main in, which I recommend you do, pull the main in some, I also recommend that you cleat the main after you pull it in some so that when it goes across, it stops well short of hitting hitting the rigging on the other side. Uh, but as it starts to go across the boat, you now want to get yourself back downwind as quickly as you can. So as soon as the boom starts to move, I don't have a wheel, I have a tiller, but I pull my tiller right away to get my, my bow back under, uh, back under the boat or back under the sail plane. That's, a, that's an important thing to avoid broaching, which you can do in any boat, even a heavy displacement one. Uh, so you want to be, you want to go from downwind up enough to get the sail to move and then back down again. You want to be turning down before the sail hits on the, uh, on the other side, the new leeward side. Um, if you're driving a spinnaker, be careful not to come out too hot. Uh, that is a guaranteed broach. That is a super guaranteed boat broach in a sport boat with an asymmetric spinnaker, but it's pretty much guaranteed in any, any keel boat in big breeze. Uh, even, even the really heavy displacement boats, you're again, like when the winds are up, there's a lot of force in that sail plan. It'll overpower the, the riding moment of your keel right fast. Um, do I have anything else? Yeah. The boat can only be turned as fast as the crew can do their job. So I, I think I've already made reference to that. And I, it, it's, it's. As the if you're the person driving the boat, it's a safety thing not to go faster than your crew can do their job. If that poor guy on the foredeck cannot get the spinnaker pole clipped in on the new uh, the new guy, you wait till he does, no matter how long it takes. And if he doesn't have the pole made the 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 spin pole made on the mast, you wait till he does. Doesn't matter how long it takes. Um, that's that's just for everybody's safety. You can yell words of encouragement at him. Although they won't, they won't sound like words of encouragement, but you can't turn up till the pole is made on the new weather side. Um, and you want to drive when you're going as fast as possible. 
This is so important in a boat that planes. Uh, it, it's true in any boat. If you can, you can start your jibe while you're surfing down a wave, everything frees up. And can anybody guess why that is? It's because your apparent wind drops, right? Like you're, you're going with the wind. So if you're going at eight knots with a 20 knot tailwind, you've got 12 knots of apparent wind in the boat. If you can get on a wave and get to 10 or 11 knots, now you're down to 10 knots of apparent wind. And if we remember, it's the square, the, the, the wind speed, right? So if you have 12 knots of apparent wind and you drop to 10 knots of apparent wind, that's like 40% less load on everything. And that makes everybody's job easier. It makes it easier to move things around. It makes it easier to pull lines. Everybody's happier. So it, it's counterintuitive. People like to do things when they're going slow, but it's safer and easier to do a drive when you're going as fast as you possibly can. Um, that... that that took it took a while for me to adjust to that uh, when i got in the viper and started to sail it downwind and it's such an apparent wind boat that uh that i was i was happy driving it no matter what condition i was in but i only became proficient at it once i started driving only when i was going as fast as i could so you if you're on full plane you want to be make sure you don't hit it you're, you're you haven't hit a wave you're at, at your top speed now's the time to drive you're in a gust Now's the time to drive. Or when you just fall out of a gust, but you haven't slowed down yet, that's a great time to drive. Uh, you're, you're going down the front of a wave and your boat speeds up and the knot meter's about to peg. That's the time to drive. Um, but people need to be prepared for that. Okay, I see the five minutes. And sail trim, uh, any questions about that? Steve's at the back telling me we have five minutes. So I got two more slides to go. I can get through them in five minutes, I think. Okay. So sail trim and heavy air. There's uh, two, I don't really talk about reaching. Uh, reaching is mostly reducing sail area. Um, so upwind uh, and downwind. Upwind, you want to depower everything. Uh, you want to set as wide a groove to sail as you possibly can. Does everybody understand what I mean when I say as wide a groove as you can? Okay, so when you're, when you're sailing your sailboat, in in brisk conditions you'll get it where it's the angle of heel is where you're comfortable and the helm responds quite well and you can vary a little bit your angle to the wind and still keep the boat manageable and and that's that's the groove you can stay in that groove where so the the amount of steering you can do in that groove that's how you deal with waves that are coming at you so you don't bury your wave you bury your bow dead in one and you don't slam right into the back of them you can climb up them and go down the backside reasonably smoothly. And the, the more you can steer, the wider that groove you can steer in, the better you look as a helmsman because the boat stays evenly healed and, you, and you're more manageable. It becomes a kind of a pleasant sail, to be honest. And that groove can be made wider or narrower by doing things with sail trim. Um, you want to understand what you're doing with sail trim so that you make that groove as wide as you possibly can you can have a fun sail through the waves. If that groove is really, really narrow where you're falling out of it, and falling out of it means the boat stands up or the boat's on a rear. And once you get out of it, it takes a long time to get back in it. And you need to be in it for a while to get your boat speed back up and be manageable again. So you wanna make the boat as easy to drive as you can. Uh, it looks, you look better as a driver, the boat goes faster and it's a, a pleasant, more pleasant ride for everybody. So that's what I mean by making, by saying set the groove as wide as possible. Set your sails up for acceleration, not for top speed. That's a, another thing like that groove thing, right? You're not going to be going. So in flat water, it, you want to, if you're if per racing anyway, you want to set the boat up so you point as high as you can and go as fast as you can. And you know that you're not going to hit any waves, so you're not going to be slowing down. So you're, you're setting your boat up for top end speed. Uh, in waves, you're never going to be at top end speed because there's always going to be another wave coming. So you're always going to be below your optimum speed and you're always going to want to accelerate. So you want to set your sail plan up so that you're always trying to accelerate the boat because you'll never get to the speed you want to be at. Uh, and the goal is to reduce drag. We spoke, we referenced that earlier, right? You, you, you already have way more lift than you need. Now you want to reduce drag because drag is a bad thing. So all of your sail trimming is done to reduce drag. Uh, and you want to keep the center of effort in the sail plan as low as possible. That's again, twisting off the top of your main so it's not generating a lot of lift, twisting off the top of your jib so it's not generating a lot of lift. Because uh, the lower that, that 
load that the result point is in your sale plan, the less writing moment you need to have to keep the boat upright. So it's less likely to be on its ear. Uh, that's part of keeping that wider, as wide a groove as you can. Uh, when you're going downwind, you want to keep the boat under the mast. So it's not fast to go downwind heeled over. Uh, you want the boat to be flat, but you want to be going as fast as you can keeping the boat flat. Uh, the faster you go, the less apparent wind you experience. Uh, and uh, if you can plane in the boat, you should definitely plane. So that's more of a dinghy and a, and a light displacement uh, keelboat thing. But as soon as you can get your boat on plane, all the loads drop and your and your rudder now also. So back to that question about how do I make my rudder more effective than my sail plan? Go faster, because at 10 knots, your rudder is incredibly powerful compared to at six knots. Mm -hmm. So if you can get planing, you have a lot more, your keel will keep you on track better and your rudder will let you steer better. Um, so upwind, um, main, outhaul tight, vang tight, Cunningham tight, backstay tight, main sheet tight. That's pretty easy. Pull everything as much as you possibly can. And if you've got a good boat and it all stays where it is when you pull it tight, your, your main is probably set up for going upwind. For the jib, back stay tight. Uh, that, so when you pull your back stay tight, it also has the effect of straightening out your forestay, right? Because you, you, when you pull on the back, the forestay gets more loaded as well. And the more loaded your forestay is and the straighter it is, the flatter the entry of your jib is. And that means you've just depowered your jib. So pulling in your back stay has the effect of depowering your jib. Uh, otherwise, crank up shroud tension. That's, the, that's a substitute for no back stay. You want to tension your shrouds as much as you can. And move your jib cars back. Uh, that does the same, that again, you, you pull the sail flatter at the bottom and let it twist off more at the top, and that lowers the center of effort in your sail. Ah, downwind. That's my last, yeah, that's my last slide, so I might go over by a minute or two, Stephen. Uh, uh, cleat the main seat so the boom doesn't hit the shrouds when driving. We already said that once, right? Uh, when you're starting a drive, you pull your main sheet in a little bit and cleat it. When it goes across, uh, you hit the cleat, then you can let it back out. It's the, it's the last thing you need to worry about in a drive is letting the main sail back out. Uh, vang enough to keep the top of the main from twisting open. Um, so that's you're, you're not going to be max vang now, but you don't let it completely off because the top of the sail will twist way off. You want to keep the, the leech of the sail just in line with the from the boom to the top of the mast. Um, Cunningham, I'd keep that tight. Outhaul, I'd keep it tight. I'd ease the backstay. Uh, and for spinnaker, you want to keep the luff curling. Uh, be aware of boat trim. Uh, in heavy air, the spinnaker can overpower the rudder very easily. Uh, anybody have experience with that? So, yeah, <laughs> I saw a couple of hands. I have experience with that. I'll, I'll, you know, it's like uh, AA. I, I volunteer my, uh, myself and put myself in that group too, for sure. Um, if you're a good spinnaker trimmer, you can make your skipper look awesome in those situations because you will feel that he no longer has control of the boat. And when he doesn't have control of the boat, it means you do. So if you let, it, that's, I, I kid you not, if you're fast enough to let that sheet go and, uh, and get rid of the healing forces out of the sail, there's a chance your skipper can pull the boat back and you pull the sheet back on and away you go again. But if you don't let, if you look at him and say, what are you doing? It's already too late. You, as the spinnaker trimmer, if you, if you feel the boat going, you can stop it a lot better than your skipper can. And I think that's it. Yes. So that's sailing in heavy air. It's exciting. Everything happens fast. And, uh, and when you do it well, it's a lot of fun. All right. Thank you, everybody. We've got a uh, $40 gift card for Van for our uh, retail website for NSD. So thank you so much uh, for giving the talk tonight. And it was, uh, I have to say, there was something accessible for everyone who has got the full range, I think, of technical sailing experience to the other end of the spectrum. Um, there was some great advice for someone like myself and just make sure everything works on the boat is a, I think, a good resolution that everyone can stick to. So lots there for everybody and thanks so much. We raised $200 tonight with the hat and the uh, uh, online uh, donations. So that's very good. Thanks to everybody here and online. And um, I think that's everything for tonight that, I've, that I can remember, Stephen. Are we good? Super. Thanks, everybody. See you next time. Thank, Thank you. you. Uh, oh, my pleasure.